we are going to um, we, we went over last time a database design example and if you have questions please bring them to my attention um, I would like to preview what you uh, are planning on doing for your database for the car example before you go ahead and implement it um, we are likely to use this uh, database going forward so we want to make sure that we get it correct so that you're in a position to build upon it. Remember, the database design is like the foundation of all your application design. If that doesn't work, that's not correct, it's going to be a struggle from there on in. Um, and therefore, we want to make sure we get it right. So run it past me, send me an ERD, or send me a, a, a draft of a database, or a diagram, or talk to me about it, or something, all right, before you go into it. Uh, I imagine um, you, you, you are likely to still have questions about this, and you're welcome to ask them uh, of me, and, and we could go over them. Um, but in class, this is what we're going to do. We're going to spend a little bit of time talking about implementing a database, uh, implementing a database design. And we're going to do that in Access. And um, the reason we do Access, at least for the first few ones, is it's simple. It's straightforward. <coughs> Probably a lot of you have some experience with it. And therefore, we can focus on the coding aspect of it. Um, if you are, want to use SQL Server or the SQL Server Express or whatever they call it now, you're welcome to do that. And I can maybe help you through uh, some things. But most examples we'll do because we don't want to spend too much time um, focusing on the intricacies of the database. Um, not that there really are that, that many. Um, the, uh, the main thing, again, from a programming perspective, is you just need to be able to connect to the database. You set your connection to the database, and once you do that, it really doesn't matter what's on the other end. Again, I, I've written applications where I've seamlessly changed between an Access and an Oracle database. All right? I had, uh, we were using an Oracle database, uh, test database at work. And uh, I didn't have Oracle on my laptop, which probably is a kind of a laughable concept, at least back in those days. But uh, I had access on my laptop. So I had a version of the database in, in access that corresponded to the version in Oracle. And all I did back and forth was just flip the connection string. I had one thing, I commented out one line and uncommented out another, and I was good to go. So that's, that's, a, that's a good thing, and you don't really have to devote a lot of time to it. Yes? I think OpenOffice has a database software, and they're usually good to converting to access in that, because they're basically the same thing, except free. I am not aware of OpenOffice having a database. Uh, the, the typical open source database <coughs> that I hear of is MySQL uh, the, the, that's used. I'm not aware of that. That doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. Um, are you what are you going to be showing in class? Access. Access. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, um, what we're going to do is we're going to implement a small database. We're just going to implement a couple of tables. After we do that, we'll start talking about SQL, which is our next big topic. <coughs> and SQL, we're going to do a little bit differently. Insofar as I'm not going to talk everything about SQL and then implement it in .NET, but rather we'll talk a little bit about SQL, do a little bit in .NET, talk a little bit more about SQL, do a little bit more in .NET and so on. So we'll sort of build on it. As opposed to the database design where we spent a couple of classes where we didn't touch uh, Visual Studio because we were talking database design. All right, anyhow, here's a database that I want to implement real straightforward. I um, want to implement the... Okay, I'm going to show this to the camera. How do the marker tips get like this? <laughs> does someone like does someone like write like this with the marker? Probably. Yeah, probably. Yeah. All right. Well, when they're banging, this is what this does, and this is what this does. All right, we're going to implement a, a straightforward table where we have students and their faculty advisors, and we'll make this ERD. And we'll even put the bells and whistles on this ERD. All right. <coughs> Again, a lot of times when I draw an ERD, I just use a simplified form of this. But sometimes you see it like that as well. And what this means, of course, is that there's a one-to-many 
complementary relationship between student and faculty. One faculty member can have many students they advise. A given student only has one faculty advisor. All right. Again, to get the cardinality of the relationship, you need to point both directions. All right. One of these has many of these, many of these, or one of these has only one of those. A lot of times where I see students do it wrong is they'll look in one direction and not the other. They'll say, oh, this is a one-to-one -one relationship because a student can only have one faculty advisor. Well, yeah, it's one in that direction. You need to go the other direction as well to truly determine the cardinality. These little symbols indicate, this indicates that the faculty person might not have any students that they advise. You know, it's possible that, that a faculty member doesn't advise any students. So that's what the O would mean, all right? Or Z, that's actually, I think, meant to represent a zero. On the other end, this indicates that a student can have at most one faculty advisor, but could have no faculty advisor. Let's say maybe an incoming freshman that doesn't really know what they want. They may not actually get assigned an advisor until later on, at least at, at this hypothetical college. All right? If it were required that a, faculty, that a student had to have a faculty advisor, even if they have no idea what their major is, they get assigned to someone, then it would be shown like this. And likewise, if it was required that a faculty member advise at least one student, then it would be shown like this. Again, that's not really practical in this case, so we'll stick with the optional. Now, remember that when we implement this, because the students on the many side of the relationship the many side points to the one, and therefore we will have a faculty ID field as a foreign key in the student table. Now let's say, we're going to make the, the, the primary key student ID, we'll store their name, actually we'll store their first name and their last name and maybe their email address. And in faculty, we'll store similar stuff. Now, um, remember we had said that uh, oftentimes we want to primary key to be a small, numeric, unchanging field. All right? We also, uh, and by we, I mean me, I prefer to have a single part key as opposed to a multiple part key. And I think that will become apparent once we start using uh, this in things like drop downs. In drop down, remember, you can have a display text and you can have a value. Well, things get a little dicey if that value, which is likely going to be the primary key of the table, but if that value uh, has a couple of parts to it, you know, um, if maybe a faculty ID number was the department code plus some faculty ID number, all right, that gets very hard to pass. That gets very hard to represent in a radio button or a drop down or anything like that. And we should, we'll, we'll probably see examples of that going forward. So I tend to prefer auto number keys because auto number keys fit all the characteristics. They're numeric, all right? They are unchanging. They're small. Every row is going to have one, so it can be a primary key. You know it's going to be unique because the database is automatically generating it. It really fits the bill pretty well. So in most scenarios, I will use an auto number key. Now, you do have some other fields that could serve as a candidate key. For example, faculty email. Every faculty person here has an email address and it's unique. So we could use that as a primary key. All right? The problem is um, it, it does fit the qualifications of a primary key. All right? But because of the fact that um, it is uh, not numeric and it contains a lot more characters than a faculty number would, um, I would say the faculty number is better. Uh, a better choice. But in terms of database definitions, this email address would be a candidate key. 
all right? And we'll see how we're going to treat candidate keys a little bit special, all right, compared to, compared to other fields. Now, email address in the student table, well, oh, that may or may not be a candidate key because it could, it is conceivable that a student would not have an email address. Um, maybe not because I know LC assigns you an email address. You could always use that one. But for the sake of argument, we'll make it a candidate key in this table and not in that table. Um, all right. <coughs> Let's go and implement this. And there's a few things that I want to show you beyond the actual creation of the tables. Real quick, um, yeah. with the slash and the optional zero on uh -huh. the faculty side, the first one represented that the student must have an advisor. What was the optional one? The, the second O. You mean like this? On the, it was yeah, the, the lower, faculty. The lower part, you had a you mean like when it was like this? Yeah. What that means is that a student at most could have one, uh -huh. but doesn't have to have any. Oh, most one. Okay, got yeah. it. Whereas this would mean it's required, the two, the two dashes. So I think I drew this one like this, which indicated that faculty member doesn't have to have any students, and a student doesn't have to have a faculty advisor. But if they do have a faculty advisor, they can only have one. Yeah. Now, there, in other notations, there is something called optional becoming mandatory, all right, which would be something like um, a student may not need an advisor their first day, but eventually every student will have a faculty advisor. Or, let's say, for example, employees, you know, um, maybe a store is hiring so many employees for the Christmas rush, all right, so that they're, they're going to hire new employees. And maybe the store doesn't know where they're going to put everyone yet, all right, and they're going to bring everyone in, train them for a week, and then they'll assign them to different departments, all right. Well, department might be an optional becoming mandatory because they may not really be assigned to a department the first day, all right, but eventually, yeah, they're going to get a, a, a department. And that's, that's, again, in database terms known as optional becoming mandatory. Um, I typically just treat that like optional. Uh, that's something that I don't really know if you could implement that in a database. You'd have to implement it as optional to satisfy the optional part. You'd have to handle the becoming mandatory part some other way. All right, let's go and create this database and access. Now, in... Oftentimes in my 143 class, the intro, I, I, I'm mostly focused on getting the tables and the keys and all that right. Uh, in this class, we want to focus on some of the, we want to look at some of the finer points as well, in addition to getting all that other stuff right. Yes. I just double checked. I think they just included a database now or one of their later versions. Okay. <coughs> I'll have to play around with that sometime. It that sounds, sounds like it because it came up with Oracle on my computer about it. So sounds like it might just be an Oracle version of it. All right. Okay. Do remember that, again, access definitely has its limitations. The fact that we will use it in examples is not meant to be like an endorsement of it as a, as a very powerful database tool. Access does. Um, access has, serves a particular need. Need for people that are creating a small personal database to handle their stuff. And, and therefore, um, you know, it's not necessarily heavy duty, it's not necessarily industrial strength, but yet the concepts of database design apply in Access just as they apply anywhere else. They do a lot of things in Access geared towards a novice too. Um, and um, 
being that we're, we're going to shoot a little higher than that mark, we're going to do things um, a little differently. All right. For example, here you can start creating a table just by adding fields in a spreadsheet, like fashion. We're going to go in and actually go into design view and create our tables. And the first table I'm going to create is a faculty table. And by convention, I like to give the table, the table's key, the name of the table name, plus ID. And I will keep it as an auto number. Because it's a primary key, you get the little key notation next to it. To change that, you can highlight the rows and click the little key button up there. If there's more than one row, you can select them all and hit the key button if there's a multiple part primary key. All right, so faculty first name. One thing I do too is I don't put any spaces in my uh, table or table names or, or column names. Um, you can do that. Again, they, they try to make this geared towards the novice, so they uh, try to make it nice and, and user friendly and all that, so you can put spaces in there. I avoid that. You can get it to work, but as eh, something I don't don't care to, to deal with or worry about. Um, all right. Some of the finer points may be from CISS 143, if you've taken that course, that maybe if you had me, I was less worried about at that point, but now we can take a look at them, are these attributes down here. For example, it's doubtful that someone has a 255 character first name, all right? So we could probably limit that to, say, 25 characters. Um, required. Yeah, we probably want to make that required. All right. Indexed. Do I want to be able to look up a faculty person by their first name? Probably not. If anything, you'd be looking up a faculty person maybe by their last name, if you didn't know uh, there. Um, think of indexes like the old days. And I wonder how many more years I can use this <coughs> analogy. But like in the old days when there were card catalogs in the library, you know, you could look up a book, you know, they're actually physical boxes of cards, and you could look up a book by title, or you could look up a book by author, or you could look up a book by subject, um, and it would take you right to it. If there's not an index on a field, the only way you can find it is doing what's called a sequential search. And a sequential search would be, you know, where you literally look at the first book in the library. Is that the book I want? No. Look at the second one. Is that the one I want? No, until you find the book that you want. All right? And again, um, you don't necessarily create indexes on every field because just like in the, the days of the library, that would take up more space. What if there was an index based on the color of the cover, for example, or the number of pages, or the year that it was published? All right? Now, those things probably don't provide a lot of benefit. And they would just take up extra space and they'd take up extra time when a new book came in to keeping those uh, updated and so on. So because of that, you don't necessarily create an index on every field. You create an index where you think it's going to add value. All right. I am going to make it required and I'm not going to make it um, indexed. Last name, on the other hand, I could see requiring I could see benefit from having an index. And I would also make it required. And when you define something as being indexed, you can indicate whether duplicates are OK or no duplicates allowed. Well, we could potentially have two instructors with the same last name. <coughs> so we will say, yes, duplicates are OK. So that means if I were to call in the payroll, for example, you know, I'm, I'm away, you know, uh, I'm out of the office or whatever, and I call with a question, and I don't know, I don't remember my ID number, which would never happen because I've, I've had that ID number since I was a student here, so it's burned into my brain, all right? It also is the same forward as backward, which helped me remember it when I first got it. So, and it's also only uh, because I went here so long ago, it's only a two-digit number. No, I'm just kidding about that part. It is a five-digit number, though, which probably most of you have six-digit student numbers. But anyhow, I digress. 
But if I were to forget my faculty ID, um, it would be nice if they could look me up by name. All right? And if there was no index, it would have to do a sequential scan of all the instructors. Now, that might not be that bad, because we're talking about computers here. We're not talking about people. And probably, how many full-time instructors are here? A couple hundred, maybe? A hundred? That really wouldn't take that long to do, even do a sequential scan. But, you know, if you were to imagine, let's say, when we get to the student table, uh, definitely a, a, an index on uh, the student last name would probably be a good thing because there's a lot more students and students would be more, li more likely than an instructor to forget their ID and in which case having an index on the last name would probably be good. All right, the next thing I said was an email address. And again, well, we said, you know, 25 is probably too big, so, or 255, rather, is probably too big, so we'll make it 25. The way we define it, we said it's required. And we also said that it is a candidate key, which means that no two people would have the same email address uh, in the faculty table. Um, we could use it as a primary key. You know, that's what a candidate key is. It, it, it was in the running for uh, uh, the primary key. It could have been primary key, but it didn't get enough electoral votes or whatever. All right? So when we have something that is a candidate key, we make it a indexed field, and we do not allow duplicates. Okay? And that's another way to say that is that's a unique index. And by creating a unique index, that enforces the integrity. Remember, all these things that we're doing in here is to make sure that the data we're getting is good. All right? That's our goal. All right? That's why we make fields required. Hey, it would be pretty silly to have an instructor. Uh, we have an instructor out on that table, but there's no name associated with it. Well, who is it? You know? I don't know. You know? Uh, if we define that an instructor has to have an email address, we're going to make it so that they have to have an email address. Um, we had this discussion last time, if I'm not mistaken, about enforcing constraints in the database versus in the application. And the conclusion we came to is remember that many applications could be accessing the same data. All right? And if we enforce the constraints in each application, then um, if one of the uh, applications doesn't do it right, you have bad data. As opposed to enforcing the constraints in the database where we can guarantee that no matter how we try to access this data, um, it's going to, uh, these constraints are going to be applied. All right. So that about does it for the faculty table. And we'll save it. Let's create another table for student. <coughs> student ID. Again, we'll make that an auto number. Student first name. We'll make text. Same kind of thing. 255 characters required. Student last name, yes, 255 characters required. And we'll make this index, but we will allow duplicates because two people, we would want to look up students potentially by their last name, but two students could have the same last name, so we'll go and, and allow duplicates. Um, email. I think we said in this case that we're not going to require an email, so we're going to leave that as no. We could still index by it if we wanted to, even if there were, um, even if there were, um, even if it wasn't a required field. That way, if they did have it, we could look up by it. But we won't. All right. Remember, you know, if we're giving an alternate way of accessing a student. Um, last name is probably a pretty good way to do it, uh, and we don't necessarily have to give like three or four different ways to do it. 
you know, we, we just want to be able to maybe access them by name, so if they don't have their number, they could pull it up. Really no need to do, again, because that, that's extra resources to maintain those other indexes. Then lastly, we have the hook back to the faculty table, which is a faculty ID. Now, faculty ID was an auto number in the faculty table. It will not be an auto number in the student table, however. It will just be a plain number. Because it's not like student one belongs to faculty member one and student two belongs to faculty member two. We need to match up the student with whatever faculty member they have. So we need to be able to assign that number ourselves. Now, as far as required goes, this is where those little zeros and dashes come in. The way we defined it, a, a student doesn't necessarily have to have a faculty advisor. So we will leave it as not being required. All right. If we made the rule that a student had to have a faculty advisor, then we'd make it required. All right. We can save it, and we are almost done. All right. What we have to do now is establish the relationship. Just because we've held the field faculty ID in both doesn't mean that there's a relationship created. So. We, we, gave them, we gave those two, two fields both the name of faculty ID just to keep it straight in our heads that, that that means the same thing, but that itself doesn't create the relationship. What we have to do is we have to actually create a foreign key. And again, this is consistent to other databases as well. Where we pick the tables and we say that the faculty ID in the student table matches up to the primary key of some other table, in this case, the faculty table. There are only very rare cases where you would not check enforced referential integrity. In fact, the only case I could think of where you would not check that is if you're converting data between formats and your data might not be good initially. You might want to not enforce referential integrity until you clean the data up and get rid of bad data. You also have the choice to cascade updates and deletes. Both those work similarly. Um, because we made that uh, our primary key an auto number key, update becomes irrelevant because we're not going to change that field. What cascade delete means is if I delete the parent row, will it delete the children? And in this case, the parent row would be the instructor, the children would be the students. Well, if a faculty member resigns, do all of his or her students have to drop out of school. No, so we're not going to cascade delete. The opposite of cascading delete is to restrict delete, which means that I could not delete a student. Uh, I'm sorry, I could not delete a faculty person if there were students assigned to them. So we are not going to cascade delete. So now we have the relationship. And we can go in and we can enter a couple of each. It is a good idea to enter data after you've created the tables. Entering data sort of gives you a, uh, a sanity check, all right? Because if you can't enter the data that you want to in the tables, you probably have to find something wrong. So let's go and enter in me. Notice if I try to enter something, eh, it's going to complain because I haven't put in the email address, which is good. someone without a uh, there's something goofy in there where, where I said allow zero um, entries allow zero <coughs> length uh, records which is kind of a very goofy feature in access alright because an empty string is different than a null and so on and so forth 